Heavenly Father, we thank you for our meeting together this morning. We thank you, Lord, because of your word that is ever fresh in the heart of genuine true Christians. We thank you because there is something in the heart of a true believer that is always wanting to hear from the Heavenly Father, something from the heart of a genuine Christian that is always wanting the Father to speak so that he will see where he falls short, where he has deviated from the path that is divinely given, or where he has not lived up to standard, so that in this time and day of privilege and opportunity, he'll be able to go back to the cross and have his life, his heart, his spirit, his mind, his soul washed, cleansed again. And Lord, we thank you because you have made us such people that are eager to hear from you. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as you speak to us this morning, we'll open our hearts, open every area of our very lives before you in Jesus' name. We pray that we'll not allow your word to fall to the ground, but that it will get into our hearts. And it will do the necessary work that you intend it should do in every heart and every life in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that none of us will belittle the word of God or think 
or act as if any part of the word of God is not important, not essential, not necessary for him or her. But that will take every bit of your word, every jot and every tittle of your word, very seriously in Jesus' name. Speak to every heart now. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, from verse 3, let nothing be done through strive of being glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. First Peter chapter 2. This walker's retreat, I expect you to open your Bible. First Peter chapter 2. And in verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. Leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. We're talking on humility and greatness. Two characteristics of the Christian life that many circles never know anything about. Humility and greatness. The world thinks about the second world and the what the church thinks about the second world. The people that do not know the Lord, they concentrate on the second world, greatness. The people that have not had change of heart, change of life, transformation in their whole makeup and constitution, they major on 
the second thing. But they will never arrive at that second thing they major on without going through the first thing. In the plan of God, you cannot get into true greatness until you go by the way of Christ, which is the way of humility and the unregenerate heart. Talking about the people that have never known the Lord, never met the Lord, have no encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. They unregenerate. They hate. They detest. They belittle. They look down on humility because actually that is the very mind of Christ. If you do not have a genuine encounter with the Lord, there is no way you will even desire, in the real sense, humility. And there is no way you'll be able to manifest humility. And the worldly church, the carnal church, the sinful church, the church nominal, not patterned after Christ, unfortunately patterned after the mind of the devil, unregenerate, carnal, devilish, sinful, just filled with human corruption of the fallen nature. Such a nominal church, visible church, will degrade, relegate to the background, forget, not even speak about it, and not even desire anything that has to do with humility, biblical humility. But then, it is that that shows that the majority of church-going people, they have devilish likeness, which is pride, haughtiness, arrogance, high look. But then, the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to repeat this lesson to his own disciples over and over and over again because the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ were very slow in getting this important lesson. It appeared they were very quick in getting other lessons, but this, they were very, very slow in getting it. Because of that, Jesus Christ had to repeat it many, many times. And he showed it by the example of the life that he lived. Not only that he taught it, yes he did, he demonstrated it. Not only that he taught, he demonstrated, he also promised that heaven will be looking at everyone. And heaven will only exalt and promote those who deliberately and permanently humble themselves. And to the measure that you humble yourself, to the measure you take the back bench, to the measure you do not want to be known, to the measure you allow self to be crucified, to the measure you allow Christ to reign on the throne, to the measure you hide yourself behind the cross, to the measure you yield yourself completely to the obedience of Scripture, that you will be humble to that measure, God, Christ, heaven will exalt you. Because he himself said that the one that exalts himself, wanting to promote himself, or to be great, filled with pride, such an individual will be abased, put down by God, and trampled under by the feet of men. Only conversion can bring a change from the unregenerate heart to being regenerate, from the human corruption to a kind of purity and from the fallen nature to the divine nature 
Only conversion can turn you around from the devilish likeness to becoming like Jesus Christ. Only conversion can get rid of the pride, the haughtiness, the arrogance, the I look away from your very heart and life. There is no reason for pride, but there are excuses for pride. Why do people, on what basis, on what excuse, do people manifest pride? Well, as we watch people, and as we look at the infallible reaching word of God, we see that people who have manifested pride, they have manifested pride perhaps on the basis of natural attributes. Maybe they are tall and they use that height for pride. Or they are short and they use that shortness for pride. Or they are plumpy and they use that for pride. Or they are lean and they use that for pride. Natural attributes. Other people because of material possession. Because they, have, they happen to have gathered more dust, more sand, more iron, more of the useless things they dug out of the earth. More than other people, they are massing, they are collecting together of those things. What I mean, houses, cement, sand, dust, vehicles, glass, iron, rubber that we make out of the thing that comes out of a tree. And then all those things they are brought together makes them arrogant and proud. Other people, because of the physical beauty, every time they look at the mirror, they renew their pride in the morning before going out. And they seem to say, see how beautiful or handsome I am. And everything they look at, every time they look at the mirror, they never think about God who created them, who gave them that facial expression and appearance. And all they will be able to think about is what they heard, not realizing it was God who made them to be like that. And what God has given, he can take away as well. That's the word of God from Job. When the boils covered him all over, he realized that not only the servants that were given, the property that was given, not only the cattle that had been given, even the skin and the beauty that had been given, that God was able to take away. In his own case, he just said, God has given the children, the cattle, the servants, all the things that he has given and God has taken away. Blessed be his holy name. And you need to realize that when you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, am I not beautiful? You better immediately go to the cross and make sure that you humble yourself because what he has given one way or the other is able to take away. Other people are proud because of social attainment. Because in the social life, they have climbed up the ladder higher than their neighbors, higher than other people. That is why they are exalted in their mind. Others, because of temporary achievement, that all women, because of temporary achievement, the achievements we have in this world are temporary. Whatever we have in this world is for a short time. And because of this temporary achievement, some people are proud, uncontrollably proud. In a way that they are so proud, and they are wiser than seven men that can give a reason. Others might say, what's your life? Why? You look proud. You act proud. You dress proud. You talk proud. Everything about you is an air of pride. But they are so proud, so permanently proud, 
irretrievably in a way that nothing can bring them back from that pride of self-exaltation and pride and destruction. Other people, because of carnal comparison, carnal comparison, every time they see another individual doing something, immediately comparison rises up in their hearts. They see another fellow with a dress. Immediately they compare and better dressed. They see another person that says he is giving testimony. See how the Lord has helped me. See what God has done for me. Immediately there's a carnal comparison. I've got more than that. They see another person riding a vehicle and he says, Hello, how are you? And then he says, rejoice with me. This is my new car. Immediately, they have carnal comparison. I have something greater than that. Immediately, somebody sings. The very first thing that occurs to them, I can sing better than that. Immediately, somebody preaches. The very first thing that occurs to them, I can do better than that. Carnal comparison. Every time they watch the life of another individual, it is always thinking, always saying to themselves, I am better. I am greater. I can do better. I can do more. There is this carnal comparison that makes them proud. Another reason for pride, denominational religious affiliation. Do you know? There are people that contribute nothing to the church. And yet, they are the people that will say, I am a member of such and such a church. And there are so many of them in our own church here. They contribute nothing to make the church progress, to make the church pure, to make the church biblical, to make the church sound. And any time, you know, they are talking and they say, ah, that deeper life is a big church. He will not allow them to land. I'm a member. I'm part of them. That's the church I go. In fact, I am an important personality in that church. And he contributes nothing to the progress and the purity and the preservation of that church. And yet, his religious denominational affiliation makes him proud. Other people are proud because of their worldly association. You see, they, are, they belong to this club. They belong to this club. In fact, it's unfortunate. There are people that call themselves by the name of Christ. And there are, there are people that also identify with this church that God has brought us. And they have this uh, kind of uh, golden thing that will show that I am not just in deeper life. I also belong to the full gospel businessmen's fellowship international. And I am not just an ordinary Christian. In fact, the full gospel businessmen are the real top notch. The high class Christian. And you see my badge, it is not for nothing. It is for something. And every time, even when they are coming to our church, they have their badge on. And when they are coming to talk to the pastor, that the pastor will realize that, well, when you look at me, you realize that I have seen Billy Graham before. I have seen this one before. I belong to because of their worldly association. An association that does not have the root in the word of God. An association that will debate the word of God. An association that makes an individual proud. You see, that is what makes some people proud. They are not willing to do like Jesus Christ has said, that we are based ourselves. We remove all those badges and throw them away. And we take the back bench. And we are not looking for any position, any special privilege, as a result of our worldly attainment. Another reason why some people are proud, because of their family attachment. Because of their family attachment. Oh, they will tell you, I come from a royal family. What are you talking about? What's a royal family? What is a greater royal family than the family of God? The people that are born again.
The priesthood of the Lord, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, the people who have been washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, and he has made us kings and priests before the Lord unto our God. But he will say, I belong to a royal family where there is idolatry, where they are killing people. Royal family, where they will, where they're still under the oppression of the devil. Royal family, where they're still making rituals. And he will say, don't you see my name in our tribe, in our village? When you see a name like that, it means an important, special family. And because of those useless, useless things, many people are proud. But the Lord wants us to understand that if we're going to walk this way, that reaches to the kingdom of God, if we're going to go this way, that is the way of the cross. It's the only way that leads home. The way that leads home, you realize today, that many, many people who are called Christians, they are forsaken the cross of Jesus Christ. They are forsaking the way of crucifixion. They are forsaking the way of humility. And a multitude followed after Jesus Christ and he turned back and looked at them. And he said, if any man follows after me and will not deny himself and take up the cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. In fact, he said, if any man comes after me and he forsakes not all things and hates his very life also, it cannot be my disciple. And so we need to understand, it's the way of the cross that leads home. Three subtitles to consider. Number one, the danger of pride. Number two, true humility in God's sight. Number three, exaltation of the humble. The danger of pride. In Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, abomination unto him, untouchable, so dirty, so evil, so corrupt, so polluted in the sight of God that a superior eyes are to behold iniquity. It says all these things are abomination unto him. And the very first thing in verse 17, a proud look. Do you see how scripture is very definite? Do you see how scripture is telling us that it is not only your heart, it is not only your words, it is not only your behavior, even your very facial appearance, a high look. It's an abomination in the sight of God. I'm sure that you might have heard some preachers that will tell you, the heart is what is important. You deeper life per preachers and people, you are always looking at the outward external thing. How people dress, how people look, how people sit. How people stand, what they eat, what they drink. After all, all that God is looking for, according to them, is all that is in your heart. And they will tell you that a person can appear to be proud outwardly. And they will say, that doesn't matter to God at all. Here is the Bible. When God speaks, let all those theologians and false preachers keep silence. The Lord is in his holy temple. And let all the earth keep silence before him. You want to realize that theologians cannot change the scripture. And the false prophets and the false teachers cannot change the scripture. And here is what the Bible says. It says these things are abomination unto the Lord. The very first thing there it says, a proud look. You, you better know this, that when the Lord touches your heart, it touches your appearance, it touches your look, it touches your behavior, it touches your conduct, it touches every part of your life. A proud look, 
a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Do you know there are people that say they are Christians? They say because our last child is young and the wife is now pregnant. Think about it. They'll go and shed innocent blood. And they will premeditate it. And they will plan it. And they will go to the chemist or the pharmacist. Or they will go to a non-believing, sinful, antichrist doctor that will help them, support them to shed innocent blood. And they come back to our choir to come and sing in our choir. And they come back in our fellowship to come and lead in our fellowship. And they come back to our pulpit. The man, the husband, that had knowledge that the wife was going to commit abortion will come back to our pulpit to come and be reading the Bible. No wonder that people are not getting saved anymore. No wonder that the power of God is not at work anymore. From the preachers to the singers to the ushers to the house fellowship leaders, your hands are full of blood. Because it says hands that shed innocent blood. God created those little babies, although still inside you. It is not the work of man. We made a mistake. Who said so? The Bible says, All my members were numbered and written in thy book before I came out of the womb. It said, Jeremiah, before you were born, while you were still in the womb, I knew you and sanctified you to be a prophet unto the nations. And some of these women will carry that prophet to be born. And he'll go and abort the prophet. And he'll say, Doctor, I cannot have another child. Doctor, I cannot stand another child. There's no money to feed another child. Therefore, kill him for me. Kill her for me. Suppose he's to be a prophet. A Nazarite of the Lord. A consecrated minister unto the Lord. I don't worry. Kill him for me. And they kill, they destroy, they shed innocent blood. And those pastors will know it. If you say, well, I didn't know. My wife went to do it without my knowledge. After you knew, didn't you keep your wife in the choir? After you knew that your wife is shedding innocent blood, didn't you keep your wife as still the women coordinator and the women rep in that same local church? No wonder God says, Jeremiah, don't call upon me for their sake. I've rejected them. I will not use them. I will not have anything to do with them. And in fact, even after what, when Jeremiah declared that to them and said, Your way is evil in the sight of God. Will you come into this house and steal and kill and do evil? And then say and profess, we have been delivered to do all these abominations. He said, repent and turn, stand in the way and see the old way and ask what is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest for your soul but the people said we will not walk therein and god said jeremiah let them alone i'll deal with them i pray that in this workers retreat you will not wait for God to deal with you. You will allow the mercy of God, the grace of God, the cleansing in the blood of Jesus Christ to deal with you in Jesus' name. And so it says, hands that shed innocent blood and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren you've seen the first scene there a proud look in proverbs chapter 16 and verse 5 proverbs 16 verse 5 everyone that is proud in heart that's where it starts in the thought in the imagination in the heart in the attitude before it comes out but it eventually comes out it begins in the heart and it says everyone everyone 
everyone that is proud in heart, there's no exception. Because God is no respecter of persons. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination. You know, there are people that will say, the Bible says, and this is true, that the woman shall not put on that which pertains unto a man. Neither shall a man put on that which pertains to a woman. Everyone that does that is an abomination in the sight of God. That is true. But do you know that's not the end of abomination in the sight of God? Everyone also that may not be wearing the slacks, that may not be dressing as a woman like a man, as a man like a woman, everyone also that may not have all those things, but is proud in the heart, is an abomination to the Lord, Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Though hand join with hand, he shall not be unpunished. Now, when we're talking about pride in the heart, this pride in the heart comes out in many, many, many ways. And let's allow the scriptures to speak. And I want you to realize that scripture is very important. When we're preaching, for example, healing, we cannot destroy the message on salvation. When we're preaching, for example, on the second coming, we cannot destroy the message on the first coming. When we are preaching about grace, we cannot destroy the message on the necessity and need for righteousness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And you want to be very careful that while you are preaching one good doctrine of the Bible, you do not destroy another part of the word of God because all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine. For correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The reason we're given the scripture is not just to preach some, take some, accept some, believe some, practice some, and neglect the others. It is to take all scripture because the part you remove out of the word of God is the part you imperfect unacceptable in the sight of god that's why you'll take the whole the totality of scripture because everything is given to us to perfect us and prepare us for that place that is so beautiful where jesus said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go i will come again and receive you unto myself so that where i am there ye may be also it is that word this word of god that will wash you like water knock you like hammer burn you and refine you like fire it is this word of god you are to hide in your heart that you might not sin against the lord it is this word of god that will be a light in your pathway so that you will not go the wrong way it will be a lamp to your feet as well so that it will lead you to the right decision every time concerning everything I told you that according to the word of God, pride starts in the heart, but then it branches out, branches out to various, various places. Let's now look at Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, from verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, not Isaiah, I hear many people preaching, they said, Isaiah said, Paul said, Peter said, so and so said, there's the Lord. Thus says the Lord, because the daughters of, this, of Zion are haughty, walking with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and missing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. I want you to notice this. Those uh, preachers in other churches, other ministries, other groups, other fellowships accusing us 
that we talk on outward things. We talk on how people dress. We talk on even how the people walk. Then they will laugh and make jest in their they'll say deeper life. That they concern themselves with things that are not necessary. They will be preaching to their women. And then they say, go and watch their church. That is why they don't have too many women in their church. Women, are you here? I said, are you here? Can you stand up and let me see you? Look at that. They said, we don't have women in our church. Can you see that now? Sit down, God bless you. I pray that people like you that love the word of God, more of you will come. You see, all those uh, deceivers, they will say, all deeper life, they don't have women in their church. I challenge them to present any other church where you have more women. And these are just workers. The majority of the people are still waiting for us at home. I challenge any church that is not standing on the word of God to come and present to us in this country any other church that has as many women that know Bible verses. Any other woman, any other child that has as many women that are consecrated, committed to the Lord. I challenge any other church in this country to present to us the people that are faithful in giving their tithe. Among the women, in all the other churches, I challenge churches in, any, in this country to present to us any other church that has women that can preach the word of God. We have, we have women leading our fellowship. We have women area leaders, we have women, women representatives, we have women who are coordinators, we have women who are missionaries, we have women who are preaching the gospel in nooks and corners of this country. And they tell us that, you know, because they are talking about women, because they are preaching about this and preaching about that, that women will never come. I tell you, they have come. And they are still coming. And more of them will keep coming in Jesus' name. Look at this. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion. You know, that is not my fault. It's the Bible that emphasizes that we address directly and we preach directly to our women. He didn't, here, he didn't even start with the men. He, he concentrates on the daughters, on the women. And it says, they are haughty. They are of Zion, but they are haughty. They are of the people of Israel, but they are haughty. Of the descendants of Abraham, but they are haughty. It says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. That's another word for being proud, being arrogant. How, do, how does their pride, their haughtiness manifest itself? Not my words, this is scripture. And walk with stretched false necks. That's the Bible. And we cannot do anything against the truth. We cannot keep quiet on preaching the truth, the word of God. They walk with stretched false necks, walking and missing. At the headquarters church here, I'm very, very vigilant on our sisters in the choir. I look at their mode of dress, and if the shape makes them conspicuously attractive, conspicuously, deliberately, while they are walking to the platform, I watch them. And I, if I see a dress that is not right, that will show some parts of the body in a very conspicuous way, that will be a temptation to the people that are watching them. I call them and I tell them this dress is not good. So they dress another way. Don't wear this again. Not in the church, not outside, not anywhere. And I, and I do that here. You see me sometimes when the choir is coming in here. Even in this retreat, I keep on standing. I watch the person that is conducting. I watch the men who are standing because that's the way we ought to stand when we're singing. I watch uh, these women as they are coming. And, uh, you know, I called people. Yesterday I called the brother who conducted this morning. I said, the way you conduct, you have to change that. I called him privately and said, this must be corrected, that must be corrected. That is leadership. Leadership is not figurehead. 
and in particular about the women it says because when they walk they walk with stretch both necks walking and mincing as they go making a tinkling with their feet that's bible do you love the bible verse 17 it says therefore did he steal they were not accused of adultery they are not accused of robbery or anything but because of the pride manifested in the way they walked stretching for their neck and the things they do therefore the lord will smite with his scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of zion what do we preach against pride in dressing pride in appearance pride in our walking pride in the way we comport ourselves because we want our brothers and sisters to be free from the judgment of God. Therefore, the Lord will smite with his scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. The Lord will discover their secret parts in that day. The Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments. Isn't that what he complained about in verse 16? And he said they should remove those things themselves. And if they do not, he said in the day of judgment, the Lord himself will remove the tinkling of their ornaments about their feet. If you go back to verse 6, he said they were making a tinkling with their feet. Because they put ornaments there. There are people that will even have the jewelry now around their ankle. They are not those who have it in their wrist. Others hang the chain on the neck. Others have it in the ears. And here God said, because of the pride that motivated their actions, that he will take those things away in judgment. And then it says, their cause and their round tires like the moon, the chains, and the bracelets, and the mufflers, and the bonnets, and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands. Headbands? Oh, yes. See, when the Bible says you cover your head, it says because of the angels, not because of attracting brothers. It's good to cover the head. It's biblical when you are praying. But when covering becomes a means of more pride, and you have this style, have that style, have that style, have that other style, some people, if they cover that thing, if you're sitting at their back, you cannot see the preacher. You have to be bending your head and bending your head. The dead gear will not allow you to see and hear properly. And in your heart, you'll be saying, all these people, where is our church tending to? And watch them Christmas time. Watch them Easter time. Watch them at the time they are getting married. Watch them at the time they are having, uh, they have got their first baby. Watch them at the time they have got job. Watch them at the time they have passed out of school. And you will see all these head gears and you say, what? So these people, they know how to do this. They're so near the world that they can do like this. On the day of rapture, there will be many surprises. It says, also the tablets and the earrings and the rings and the nose jewels and the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins and the glasses 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 well if you look at the original it says mirror and you see there are people that have mirror in their bag <laughs> are you not surprised when you are in the vehicle You'll find these women just before they land, before they get to the place they are going, they take the mirror out and they look at it and they put their lipstick all over again and they do everything because, you know, they, and when they reach that office, when they are coming out again, they look at them every time they are looking at them. The mirror is there all the time. If we are to check the, their bags this morning, church, church, mirror there, mirror with all the other things in the bags that now they are using so that every time, every moment, every minute, they will keep up to date before the world, but they are out of touch, out of date with the Lord. 
And it is so important that you look at the scripture. Because it says, and the glasses. But then I must also talk about the glasses we wear. You see, the glasses we wear, they are just to help us read the Bible. To help us read the papers. Help us read the materials we need to read. Help us see very clearly that is just the aim and the goal. But when a person, he, he, wants, uh, he or she wants to buy glasses, and then he will take this one, how much is the frame of this one? 600 naira. How much is this frame? 2,000 naira. How much is that frame? 2,500 naira. And then they put on the most expensive frame. And they say, uh, optician, how do I look? Does this? Is this one? And the optician will say, you look like, uh, you look like a queen. You see the optician that will make you a queen. Are you not a queen already? Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Your name in the book of life. Are you not a king? A queen already. And you look like a queen. And uh, the fellow will say, well, this is my three months salary. But to keep up my image and my pride, I will take it like that. I don't have much money now. I'll pay you 500 now. Put me down in your debtor's book. Because of the frame. And there is the frame there that you can easily buy. And finish up the pain. But pride will get you into debt. And the glasses. And the fine linen. And the hoods. And the veils. It shall come to pass. That instead of sweet smell, it says there will be, there shall be a sting. Instead of a girdle, a wrench. Instead of well set air, boldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of star sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Do you know that there are people today, the ordinary belt we have is not, not is no more enough and sufficient for them they need to have this golden silver belt what's that for isn't that the bear the, the the belt the girdle is just to make your clothes firm on your body why all this foolish expense sometimes in their shoe you will have all the gold and the beads on the shoe ah uh ah -uh. If we say we are not proud like the daughters of Zion, what is pride? Eh, God knows my heart. Uh, but what we see outside came from your heart. Your heart is proud. That is why you have all these things in the early days of preaching the gospel. By the grace of God, when we preach the word of God like this immediately, the people who are pilgrims and strangers in this world, who will not allow the fleshly lust to war against their soul. The people who are looking for a better country, who are not mindful of the country they came from, or otherwise they would have had a reason to go back. The people whose citizenry or citizenship is in heaven, and where they're looking for the Lord, where he will come and change a vile body. The people who realize that they're going to a home, they're going to a kingdom that is not of this world, they're going to a city that is built not with the hand of man, but with the hand of God. Those people, when they hear the word of God, immediately after hearing the word of God, they go back to where they come from, and they destroy those things. They burn them. Him, so that by the grace of God, the haughtiness and the pride of the daughters of Zion will be taken away from them. And I pray that it will be so like that among us in Jesus' name. You see, pride is so terrible. In fact, if you're looking for the origin of pride, let's look at it. In Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Reading there from verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou caught down to the ground? With deeds weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Can you see pride there? I will, I will, I will five times in two verses. 
Then it says in verse 15, Yea, yet thou shalt be brought down into hell to the sides of the pit. He said in verse 13, I will exalt my throne. And then the word of God says, Thou shalt be brought down. Whosoever therefore shall exalt himself shall be abased, brought down. And you see, pride was the motivating force in the heart of Lucifer, the morning star that became the prince of the power of the air, the god of the world of darkness. He was the morning star before. Cherub, covering cherub before. But then pride brought him very low. In Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity be found in thee. What iniquity? The iniquity of pride in verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of what? Because of what? Because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of, the bra of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So you will see the great sin that brought Lucifer to become Satan, the devil. And the Lord is still challenging us and reminding us that we will not have anything to do with pride. Now you see pride, as I've told you, manifests in different ways. Pride manifests itself, as we have heard in Luke. The way we look. The way we appear. The way we dress. The air we build around us. Two, it may manifest itself in speech. The way we speak. Have you seen the case of Lucifer? Have you seen the case of Satan the devil? Have you seen? He said, I will, I will, I will, I will exalt my throne. Pride can, can exhibit, demonstrate itself in the speech of the individual. Now you will find there are people, whenever you are discussing together, other people have said good, good things, deliberately. They will put down everything that every other person said, and then they will begin to talk as if they are the very deposit of the totality of wisdom. It is pride in speech that will make a person belittle others in his speech, look down on others in speech, criticize in a very negative, cutting manner the people that are doing their best, and yet this fellow will never recognize or realize it. Pride in speech. You've seen pride in walking. I read the scriptures to you. The daughters of Zion. And there are people that do that deliberately. If you are not doing it deliberately, but it's just out of the result of the pride in your heart, it has to be corrected. And you have to tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I do not want to be one of the daughters, haughty daughters of Zion. I want a change in my look, in my speech, in my walking, in my appearance. Others in attitude. You don't see the attitude. You see the disposition. You see the way they carry themselves. And you can tell they are always of the consciousness that I'm not like other people. I'm better than other people. I'm greater than other people. They cannot mix freely with the people of God, the children of God. They always want to distinguish themselves as if we are not all the same in the family of God. Attitude, others in behavior. In behavior, you see some people are uncontrollable. And uh, they, it may be in the choir you cannot control them. The choir master cannot tell them, uh, this and this will sing now. Uh, they will become so puffed up, so proud, so arrogant. I can sing better than all these people. I can't understand why they are choosing the other people. And they become so moody and they swell up just because of that. It is because of the pride in the heart. 
other people do you see as we are told all these people from this region that region go to the kitchen and go and carry our food we are going to eat and all our sisters from those regions uh, please position yourself in the proper places because you will help us to serve and you see the people who are proud you will see their behavior they just put their hands in the pocket and watch the other brothers going to carry the food they won't even stand up but brother, are you not from that region they called now? Leave me alone. I'm not their equal. I don't carry food. And then you will see those sisters that are to serve. Some of the sisters will not even boil. They will not, they will not rise up. All the others will be carrying the food and serving. And they will sit down. They are from those regions. What is that? Is that Christianity? Is that humility? Is that the mind of Christ? Christ who rose up. Christ, the highest, the greatest, the Son of God, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He took a bowl of water and he knelt down and began to wash the feet of his own disciples whom he called, whom he saved. When Peter saw it, he said, My Lord, do you wash my feet? He said, You will never wash my I will not take this one. I have seen humility in you, the Son of God. I was on the mountain when the father said, This is my beloved son, hear ye him. I heard the story. I was not called at that time. But when you were baptized in water, and when you were coming out the door, the Spirit of God came upon you. And a voice of God said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. You will not wash my feet. And Jesus said, If I do not wash your feet, you have no part in me. It's, my, it's part of my responsibility to show the example, to kneel down, to bend down. The Lord, greater than region overseer. I'm talking about the Lord. Greater than pastor. Greater than general superintendent. I'm talking about the Lord, the one that left heaven, the savior of the whole world, the master of angels. He went down like this and he washed the feet of his own disciples. And then after he had washed them, not only that, he didn't, he didn't give them the towel or throw the towel to them, um, wipe it off, he, he, he held the feet of Matthew the publican and held the feet of John the son of thunder and he began to wipe it gently and lovingly and cleaned it. Then he laid it aside. Then he faced all of them. He said, do you see what I've done for you? I'll be going away. Do it among yourselves. If ye know these things, happy are ye. If ye do them, when I go, I'll be watching you from heaven. Don't let me see that pride, that argument, that strife. Who shall be greatest among us? Don't let me see that. I've laid an example. You call me Lord and Master. And so I am. And if I, your Lord and Master, if I've done this to you, do it to one another. And so you'll find these sisters that we said, now the sisters should help us to serve. They will not even get up to serve. If they ever get up to serve and they get to this area and they are serving the food and they look at a very uh, small, according to them, small girl, small boy. They say me. I'm the one to serve this one. They will move from that area and they will go to the other area where she believes the people that are worthy of her service where they are sitting. That's Christianity. You turned this church upside down. You have polluted this church. You came in, you drank pure water of the gospel. And then you put your feet in that water. You model it up and look at the water we are giving to the people now. Messages that don't have any meaning. Messages that don't break us down and make us humble and go back to the cross. May God have mercy on this church. And may God have mercy upon all of us. That by the grace of God, in Luke, in speech, in walking, in appearance, in attitude, in behavior, will be humble in Jesus' name. Other people demonstrate pride in their plans. They always have these big, big plans. They never like to plan any little thing or start in a small way. They always have these big, big plans. Other people are proud in their decisions. Other people are proud in their purchases. They go to the market and the things they are able to buy back from the market is a symbol of their pride. If they are going to choose something to buy, the most costly, the most expensive, 
the latest, uh, the latest kind of a make that has come. They are never for the normal thing. Uh -uh. Didn't Jesus say, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? I thought that we're only dressing to cover our nakedness. Why do we have to spend three hours in the market before we can buy ordinary dress? The time we should spend in evangelizing, in praying, and doing other useful, wonderful things. We'll spend all that time negotiating and bargaining when we could have gone there to buy what we want to buy and come back home to do other important things. In purchases, in decorations. You find many people today, the decorations in their houses. They even get to the point that if you enter their house like this, the primary school living certificate is there on the wall. Then the modern school is there on the wall. Then secondary school is there. GCO level is there. And advanced level is there. Everything like this, everything is there. And then the marriage card, that uh, ordinary card that was sent to people, that those who are going to get married, that they waste a lot of money and send to people. They will put, you know, the card here, the card there, and the card. all the houses are decorated with this useless and should have thrown into the waste paper basket. The greeting card of six years ago that somebody sent to them, they put it on the table. A wedding card that somebody sent to them three years ago is there on the table. Certificate all on the walls. I'm a Christian. A Christian where? You think they meet Christianity just on the road like that? Those are Christians, the people that are not born again. That everything they do is, demo is a demonstration of pride. All the decorations that they have and the boasting, ah, they boast almost more than the devil. And they oppress other people. Do you know women that will say, I will show you, I'm the pastor's wife. And they will oppress that lady in the church until you bow and submit. I will show you. In this church, <laughs> you will know that all women are not equal. I will show you that I am the pastor's wife here. They may transfer us later, but as long as I am here, pastor's wife, when she talks, you will listen. My friend, what is that? That kind of oppression that we know that this individual, she is a child of God, she has no sin, she has not committed any offense, except the offense of not becoming a slave to the pastor's wife, except that offense which has no record in heaven, except that offense that she has not voluntarily yielded to me to become my slave, where we will oppress her, <laughs> she will smell pepper, and she will be praying all the time, Oh Lord, I don't want to backslide, I don't want pastor's wife to send me to hell. I will endure. If they are praying on you that they will endure, don't you know that something is happening there? And it is pride. Instead, if you call a sister so-and-so, see this uh, non-entity. Call him my name. Me. Me of all people. All right. I will show you. What is that? We call Jesus. How do we call Jesus? We call him Jesus. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's the one that came from heaven. Born of a virgin. Not born like you and me. Not born in polygamy. Not born with even ordinary marriage. Born of a virgin. And the angels, when Jesus Christ was born, they sang together. And the person that when he was born, angel sank, it changed, in fact, his birth changed the date of history. They have been, you know, all the time before Jesus was born, the world had been reckoning years and years and years. Immediately Jesus was born, we have this date before Christ, this date in the day of the Lord A.D., referring to Christ. And yet, we just call him Jesus, we call him Christ. Sometimes we say Christ Jesus, sometimes we say Jesus Christ. If they call my name directly, the people are in trouble. What's this? What kind of church is this? That is not taken after the master. Not taken after the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And because of these little petty, petty things, we oppress people we, to subdue them, to make them yield to our pride so that by force they have to be exalting us because we want to be exalted. Other people are proud in the choice of friends. Others, they segregate themselves. They segregate themselves. When one of our uh, brothers was preaching here yesterday, and he said that when he was still around here in Lagos, that he used to, you know, stay close to me, and that I could allow him to sleep in the same room that I was uh, sleeping at the workers' retreat, and that he, I could drive, that time I didn't have a driver. And if I was tired, I would not be ashamed. I would, say, I would say, I want to sleep and all of you wait. When he said that, I thought in my mind, can the region of Aseas do that today? Or do we just give it as example that the GS did that? And he's a person that will lower himself to anybody and give himself to anyone and everyone. Do we just say it as example? He did it. Jesus did it. We ourselves as overseers, can we do that? If the accommodation is not enough, can we allow the pastors, district pastors and others to come and stay with us in that room? No, we are overseers. Has the Bible changed? Has the word of God changed? Are we just to give these things as examples? That Jesus did it, Jesus did it, this one did it, Paul did it. How about we ourselves? You are going to the same heaven I'm going to. There's no other heaven. There's only one heaven. And if it takes humility and yieldedness and giving yourself to the Lord, this is what it will take for everyone. It is for me and for you the way of the cross leads home. I will bid farewell to the, world, to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. For my Lord says, come, and I respond, I want to go. Where I will be with him up there. And it is the way of the cross, the way of crucifixion, the way of humility, the way of meekness, and the way of lowering yourself, the way of lo loneliness that will lead to that heavenly glory heavenly home and therefore we must realize that it is very dangerous to be proud we'll yield ourselves to the lord and be fully completely humble before the lord our time is gone but number two true humility in god's sight true humility in god's sight in romans chapter 12 romans chapter 12 and in verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. That's true humility in God's sight. In honor, preferring one another. And the Lord expects that you and I, it will not just be humility of the past, it will be humility in the present. And that humility will continue till we see the Lord face to face. In honor, in honor, preferring one another. I'm going to ask you a question. If in honor we prefer one another, will there be a problem? If we told someone to preach, you'll never think, well, why didn't they allow me to preach that? It's better. That's the will of the Lord for this time. He's supposed to do it. The will of the Lord be done. Or you are sent to a particular location to go and preach. And then your neighbor, your fellow brother is sent to another location to go and preach. You're not going to be comparing the numbers. Look at that. In that church, they have 200. In the church, they sent me to. It's only 50. How am I going? Why did they send the other brother to a 200 member church and they sent me to a church that is only of 50? In honor, preferring one another. Look at the district they have given brother so and so. The people that are in that district are educated people. They are wealthy people. Look at the district they have sent me to. The district of illiterates. The, 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 the districts of people that do, does not know, do not know how to do anything. The district of people that you even have to be teaching them how to read. Why did they send the other brother to the district where they are well educated? And look at the place they have sent me. In honor, preferring one another. Well, we said we are going to marry. And see, the, uh, see what the pastor has done. The pastor attended brother so-and-so's marriage. 
And when it was my turn, I asked him, Pastor, I, I believe that you will come to my marriage. And the pastor said, you look at the program at this time, things are so choked up, I will not be able to attend. Aha, uh -huh. you see now, when it came to my turn, they are not going to attend my marriage. They attended the marriage of brother so-and-so in honor, preferring one another. This is Christianity. I pray that in this workers' retreat, we'll go back to original Christianity, to biblical Christianity. Because all of us were expected to be humble before the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. From verse 5. Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Submit yourselves unto the elder. What does that mean? Does that mean that the local pastors should be submissive to the region of overseer? Oh yes. But then, it also means that the overseer should be submissive to the general superintendent. Because, you know, whatever you know now, whatever you've got now, even salvation, think about it. Many, many years ago, before we had all these overseers, when our brother was preaching last night, I said, praise the Lord. He used to come all the way from Onicha to Benin to attend the Bible study, to just want to hear the word of God. And now when I saw him and, and I saw the dynamism and the preaching, I said, praise the Lord that these uh, brethren who are young those days and they knew next to nothing, but now, they have the knowledge of the word of God. But then, think about it this way. That whatever you preach now, whatever you know now, many years ago, you knew nothing. And God used the pastor in Lagos here to teach the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept. Therefore, you will know that he is older than you are in the Lord. He knows more than you know. And he has brought you up. And I'm talking about everybody. And it says the younger will submit unto the elder. And you will understand that both in age, in understanding experience, and in Christian maturity. I happen to be your elder. And therefore, you will submit. And that is the only thing. That will, make sure, that will make you know that you're obedient to the scripture. Whatever talent you have, whatever gift you have, whatever it is you have, if that submission is not there, you are out of line with scripture. In this church, there is no apology. There is leadership. And leadership still demands that you'll obey them that have the rule over you. And in some regions, in some uh, districts, in some localities, we have been having some people that will say, no, it's the GS in Lagos that sent you here. We don't accept you. There's nothing like that. Nothing like that. You will submit yourself if you are still a Christian. If you are on your way to heaven, you will submit yourself unto the elder. What do you know? Do you know the mind of God more than your leader? Do you know the depths of the revelation of God more than your leader? Why is it we sent a region overseer over you there and you said, no, we don't want him. We're going to write to Lagos. What writing are you going to write? Are you going to do the work of God for him? Are you going to take the place of God? Are you going to... Is it not by prayer and submission that whatever God wants to change, he will change? Is it by force? Is it by violence? Is it by demonstration? You know, in your cities, in the political realm, whenever they don't like anything, they begin to carry placard and they begin to demonstrate. Have you seen that before? I said, have you seen that before? <laughs> Should we do that in the church? Like as I'm preaching now, when I talk on jewelry and I talk on against your powder, against your palming, against your lipstick, then somebody will come and remove the microphone uh, from me. Is that right? Submit yourself. Submit yourself. And it says in that verse 5, Yea, all of you, be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. 
So then, there should be true humility manifested in our heart, in our attitude, in our desires, in our marriage expectation and marriage plan, in gentleness, in meekness, in our attitude and willingness to do any work in the church, any work in the church, before we built this auditorium, when we used to have a tent, and we'll build the tent for our retreat. You know how we used to do it? Our brethren, graduates, people working in highly placed places, highly placed places, they will all come with their vehicles, they pack all their vehicles on the other side. And every one of them, managers in their places of work, they take cutlasses and go to the bush over there. And I follow them. And all of us, all of us, it's only when we come to the uh, teaching of the word, I come to the pulpit. But then at that time, all of us will go there and they'll be cutting, they'll be cutting. And then I'll be encouraging them. That's how we'll work together in the early days of deeper life. Today, there are people, they can't do that. They'll put their hands in their pockets. Oh, what, Bagada? Oh, what? Starting the building of that church. All of us will take wheelbarrows and will take shovels and will take various things. And the women that could not even do anything will tell them to be marching around that place and singing and believing the Lord. All of us were involved. But today, how is it now? We can't find people to cook in the kitchen. We can't pe find people to sweep the ground. We can't find people to build. We have to go and take laborers from outside to build a church for you where you will sit down and hear the word of God. There are carpenters there. They cannot build the benches where we are going to sit down and worship God free. We have to pay them. And there are all these people there. It says all of you, be clothed with humility because God resisted the proud. He giveth grace to the humble. We must be willing to do any work in the church. We must have the spirit of servanthood. We must have condescension to men of low degree. We must demonstrate humility in our ambition, in everything. What will God do if we accept to humble ourselves in Matthew chapter 18, verse 4? Matthew chapter 18, verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself. Don't say, God, come and humble me. He says, do it yourself. He knows we can do it if you are willing. Are we willing? I said, are we willing? Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, whosoever, are we there? Are you ready to humble yourself? Where are you? Can you rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer? Lord, I will not allow pride to ruin me. Pride in dressing. Pride in appearance. Pride in speech. Pride in the way we walk. Pride in attitude. Pride in behavior. Pride in my decisions and plans. Pride in purchases and decorations. Pride in posting. Pride oppressing other people. Pride segregating ourselves. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of God. What you have seen in the example of Jesus Christ, can you do it? Can that become a permanent pattern in your life? Be
being lowly, being meek, being humble, in honor, in honor preferring other people, not having high estimation of yourself, not belittling other people, thinking that if anybody can do anything good at all, you are the only one who can do it. Jesus said, if ye know these things, happy are ye, if ye do them. Humble yourself in the sight of God. Humble yourself to walk with the Lord. Let him take away that root of pride. What have you got that God has not given you? Let him take away that root of pride. That high look. It's abomination in the sight of God. He that exalts himself shall be abased. That's the unchanging, infallible word of God. But whoso will humble himself will be exalted. Don't worry about the exaltation. Concentrate on the humility. Leave the exaltation and the greatness in the hand of God. You concentrate on the humility. And purge yourself of words of pride. Be cleansed of the attitude of pride. If in your language you are disrespectful to leadership in the church, what are you proud about? Don't you know that is exhibition of a corrupt, depraved, unconverted heart. Call upon the Lord so that you have genuine conversion, genuine salvation. Jesus, the high and the holy, he was meek, humble, and lowly. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. He humbled himself to the very death of the cross. He demonstrated humility. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them.